Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where three cycling nerds, well, two this time, because uh, Ewan has been caught up with some other things, talk about what's been happening in the world of cycling. And, well, Patrick, it's just me and you for this one. And, uh, yeah, a week of Amstel Gold, week of the Prantus Pile, week of the Giro de, what's it called, Abruzzo, not Giro de Sicilia. But, uh, yeah, where should we start? Amstel Gold, obviously, uh, we talked about it on the Cycling Dane Extra channel. Shameless plug already, we're already... 30 seconds in but we did the recap race analysis and uh, yeah your man pitcock winning the race quite phenomenal to be honest yeah, it was pretty good wasn't it i think that yeah it, it it seemed like after a couple of years ago where he didn't get it against wow it seems quite <laughs> nicely rounded but he he won it he actually said in like the post-race interview he said something about that and it was just quite a nice little i don't know it's just a funny little kind of thing that somebody's saying commentary is just good to see girls good victory good to see hershey back but out rounding out the podium you know you just cannot shake this melissa bike you can't keep them down despite the news which has been coming out this week about them and then yeah but i'm also tell yeah because the far take of the win there but i was good to see he's he's super good at that race if you take a look at his results on that race it's it's ridiculous i don't think he's ever finished outside the top eight and taken the win there it's, it's a very Kuznafois style of race, but, you know, that was a good performance also for, like, Israel, Premier Tech Vath, Joseph Blackmore, really kind of showing himself. He also won the under-23 Liège Baston Liège this week. Uh, so, who knows where he'll end up, whether he'll stay at Israel, Premier Tech, or not. I think a lot of people are saying Ineos are knocking on the door or whatever. I kind of hope that's not the case, because I I, I'm not sure how Ineos would work out for him. They've already got Pidcock. Why do they need another another one but and then yeah in the Giro the what was it the Bruzzo something like that Ambruzzo Ambruzzo obviously <laughs> podcast favourite Alexi Lutsenko oh yeah that was uh, quite he's, he's racking up some good one week stage races last year we saw him in the tour of Turkey as well winning that I mean Oh man, I mean, I think the writer of the week is almost, <laughs> it's almost sealed in stone here. Well, we talked about Amstel Gold over in the recap, so glossing over that again will be a bit. Uh, the women's as well, my favorite female pro cyclist, Marianne Voss, winning what was a quite unusual finish. Was it Demi Waterringer who celebrated uh, before the line or? Uh, um, Bieber's celebration. Ah, okay. Too early. I think when you take a look at the screenshot, take a look at where she starts posting up. It's quite early. I'd say it's at least 20 meters before the actual finish line. It's quite early and Voss gets her on the line. And you know what? I think you can't, if you're celebrating that early, you kind of deserve it, to be honest with you. I was quite happy to see Voss win. It was SD Works just, sorry, SD Works Pro Time. Uh, if they, uh, I don't know. I didn't feel like they deserved the victory, to be honest with you. I don't think, but they were re- being really cagey about working on the front. And whenever they did, Kopecky never really seemed to be chasing that hard. And like they had other riders that are like Blankovas and Brashevold who just didn't seem to contribute to the chasing until it was too late. And yeah, so I didn't really think that Stewart Pro Time didn't like deserve to win. So I was quite happy to see Voss win, uh, mug it on the line. And then, you know what, when you post up that early, you kind of deserve it. To be honest, to be it was very, it was a very alpha leap move. To be honest, but yeah, I mean, I think the main talking point is to do with Van der Poel, isn't it? He was the big favorite, and he had in the women's race. Oh no, sorry, <laughs> if he rocked up to the women's race, he'd probably be the favorite there as well. But yeah, Van der Poel twenty second. It was um, a little bit under underwhelming. I think he he was outmatched today. What, what did you make of it? Lowest finish for him in a road race in 2024. Oh my god, what? Yeah, she left a Done, Curse of the Rainbow yeah. jersey, that's what's happening. Uh, well, not to go over the same ground that we've already talked about, but like you were saying a lot that he was very exposed. Pickcock kind of disappearing up the front was quite sneaky. Well, not sneaky because it was just, he did it. Like, just went unnoticed a bit on the descent, which was a clever move by. Pickcock, but Machavanapol, we were all kind of just like, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We're going to get the Machavanapol Steam Express coming. It just never came. And uh, yeah, 22nd. I don't, well, kind of the 
the much wonderful fun boy in me who doesn't really care about him winning up still gold because he's already won it so who cares if he wins a sec- uh, second time is that he was just using this as a tune-up for Liège, Baston Liège next week where he's going to win it and take another monument and that is what's going to happen That that's what I hope is happening right now but I'm not sure that that's going to come to fruition. We'll talk about Liege, Baston Liege in a bit, but uh, yeah, Patrick, what what did he do from now on? Because we we talked about this before as well. Like, um, he, I mean, solid solid year already. The first time he won the Tour of Flanders and Pyro Bay in the same year helped Jasper Fiedelson win with Milan San Remo. Like, he, the guy does not need to do anything. He can just sit up and wait until the Olympics or Tour de France or whatever. But um, yeah, we spoke about him that he might be missing the Tour de France potentially or leaving early in favor of the Olympics, which is happening in Paris, obviously, a very testing road race. He is desperately wants that Olympic medal. But yeah, what is next for Macho Van Paul, do you think? I mean, according to everybody else, yeah, the next couple of races, it's Liège and then it's just Olympics, followed by World Championships. If that is the case, that would mean that Van der Poel would in total race day numbers for 2024 would have let's take a count one two three four five six seven eight nine race days would be all that he would have which seems off well it is awfully low it's not just seems it is it is a, a very low number yeah i don't know whether he'd go to the tour or or not it seems more and more prominent nowadays that riders just kind of fly down from their volcano and just kind of rock up to a race and do well. I don't know whether Van Poel would do part of a tour. I think it would make sense. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be possible for him to do that. Alpsin would probably like to have the World Championship bands flaunted around in France with the most eyes possible on it. He would help Phillips and out an awful lot to try and get some stage wins. We saw that last year, how good of a lead out he is. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see Van der Poel go to the Tour and then the Olympics. But like you say, he'd probably leave the Tour early, much to Eddie Merckx's distaste. I think that would make the most sense to me. I mean, I don't know about... What, like, this isn't a World Champs clip, but like, do you think a World Champs call suits Van der Poel? I think it's too early for him. Yeah, for for sure not. So is it just like Olympics? And then that's it. And then back into cyclocross. We're not going to see a lot of him, basically, if his current program is to be believed. I mean, he hasn't won the Tour of Denmark, which Wal mm-hmm. Bernard has, so maybe that should be <laughs> on his program. Oh, God. I mean, he, maybe Bing Bang Tour or something like that. Uh, it's a home tour in a way. It's not the Tour of the Netherlands, but it's Benelux anyway. I don't know. Uh, I, it would be a great shame not to see Macho Van Paul at the Tour de France with the Rainbow Bounds. We were talking about this with Remco Van Paul, that he didn't go to the Tour de France. And there is no guarantee that you're going to be world champion ever again. Like, yeah, we had Peter Scan three years in a row. We had Al Philippe three, uh, two years in a row. But there's no guarantee that you're ever going to get those Rainbow Bounds back. So why would you not want to show it off at the biggest race in the world? Exactly that. I think you hit the nail on the head. Boom! Mm. Yeah, there is no guarantee. Like, Van der Poel is, at the end of the day, we can all admit, absolutely bonkers. As a bike rider, he's so good, but that doesn't guarantee anything, especially in the World Champs, which just seems to be one of the more unpredictable races of the year because it's not trade teams. It's it's all slightly different. So, yeah, I think you're right. I'd like to see Van der Poel at the Tour. I can understand that he won't go to the Giro because that's you know, but yeah, Van der Poel to the Tour. I mean, he's only won a single stage of the Tour de France. It was probably the most miraculous one. It was absolutely, it was had so much kind of special nature about it because he took the yellow jersey at the same time. But I don't know, it would be cool to see Van der Poel there as well because I'd like to see another Van der Poel Tour de France stage. It seems like he wins all these fantastic one day races, but. But just there's like a, there's a lack of Tour de France stages there, which seems slightly, I don't know, weird. I mean, him and Wout agreed when they were 12 years old. You take all the one day races, I take all the Tour de France wins. That's because their careers, if you line, if you put both the Palmares together, they almost intertwine. Yeah, they do. 
it's just right. yeah wow does win has won a lot of tall stages doesn't he yeah for sure and Macho yeah. is far behind in that category but then yeah. he if he says okay I raise you monuments and what yeah. goes what's that that's true <laughs> yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll throw one in, in San Remo. I mean, but there's one thing about Wild Bernard won't be winning this year, and that's Giro d'Italia stages. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, friend of the podcast, Jack Burke, we were having the discussion two weeks ago about that, and uh, Jack was adamant that he was happening. We believe Pro Cycling Stats, Pro Cycling Stats said he's not going. And uh, yeah, that's the great shame. We got the message from him, uh, from... This Millie Spike saying, yeah, he's decided not going to uh, the Giro d'Italia. So then missing out on the appearance fee as well, I guess. Well, yeah, he's not going to be there. So, um, yeah, what do you, in terms of that, what, how does that change uh, this Millie Spike for the Giro d'Italia as well? Because we, obviously, they've been hampered with, we'll talk about Vingo in a bit, but. Vingol is not going last year. They won with Primus Roglic. She's not there in the team. So, um, yeah, I think, is it Kieran Altenbrook who is leading the squad? I mean, great opportunity for him and really to show himself. Yeah, you're a big fan. I'm a big fan. And, uh, yeah, but losing a Wout, it it could potentially be a good thing as well. So he's not taking too much of the, okay, he went stages by himself. But, like, he does command a lot of the team's focus because he's such a big name he is wild banal he is this galactico of the sport so maybe this actually does help kian outerbergs a bit or what do you think oh well of course well you said that yeah yeah so the current replacement is that laporte's going it's a good thing that christoph laporte's going because if cone valman went it would have left olaf coy without a single fast switch muscle fiber to lead him out it's a shame that Wout's not going to the Giro. It was like a big announcement months and months ago. We were talking about Wout's prospects at the Giro, how many stages he could win. It was going to be like a tall 2022. So it's a real shame that he's not going. And I guess he provides maybe a bit more mountain train support for Ryder Brooks and the ambitions that he has in this race, which, I don't know, maybe those are feeling pretty high at the moment with, you know, Maybe he's feeling like he could probably crack a top five with the field that's going to this race. I don't know, you might see maybe a Vismalisa bike team with a bit more stage hunting aspirations. I mean, outside of, yeah, Coy and, and Ida Brooks, guys like, you know, Attila Walter and Jan Dratnik might be sensing some opportunities to get into the breakaway as well. So you might see a bit more of a dynamic team, I suppose, at the Giro, but yeah, Wow's He's not even going to the tour. Yeah, you know, that wasn't announced in the in the video that was released. They didn't even really hint at all where his next race would be. Um, a full stop. I guess just want, not wanting to raise our aspirations to towards anything, which is which is smart. Do you think is it still just the Olympics, and we're just going to not know what conditions were out in at all going into the Olympics? just the olympics i mean it is just the olympics when it comes to road racing i think it's just one race it's oh what i i still think it should be under 23 riders only i don't that's how it used to be it used to be amateurs but that's kind of derailing this whole conversation onto something else i think if we're losing wild it's already losing wild in the classics campaign is a big robbery imagine if we had him in amstel he could have been up there, imagine if we had him in Paro Bay, he could have been on the wheel of uh, Machuanapol. Imagine him on, he could have done the same thing in the Tour of Flanders as well. So I think all the, yeah, wow, has just, his absence has just robbed the cycling world of or could have been so much better and more intrigue. And people getting bored of Machuanapol winning could have uh, been a bit, well, maybe not, wouldn't have been the case. Uh, yeah, what do I think he should do next? I mean, not having him at the Tour. I mean, the, we'll talk about Jonas next, but like the whole this Melissa bike project for the 2024 season has just been kind of evaporated in a way uh, because of these two crashes that were dreadful for the team and the other riders involved as well. But uh, yeah, I don't know what he should do next, to be honest. Um, I was also going to ask, yeah, you should tell us what you think he should do next. And I want to know 
what is a good Giro now for this Melissa bike, considering they won last year as well? What should Wout do next? And well, obviously, he's got really bad injuries, but I think it was the ribs, which they specifically said in the video, which was really hampering his training because it just makes it quite painful to breathe. can only imagine what that must feel like. Yeah, I think it'll be the Olympics. Maybe he might do like the TT and the road race, I presume. I think it's quite a lot to put into the road race, considering it's like four-man teams. It just seems so unprecedented. Like nobody's going to have any idea how to race that race. I feel like maybe putting him a TT, he might do a TT as well, just as a bit more of a insurance policy that he, he could definitely get something out of that as well. Even if it's just like, if it's not a gold, he could definitely get a bronze or a silver for sure I think in terms of what this Melissa bike would want out of a Giro I'd say that Koi getting his his first Grand Tour victory would be probably the main thing on the cards I would rather Koi get his Grand Tour victories than Ita Brooks being like you know just an, another like top 8 or whatever and just not really you know it's like It'd be like a very Leonard Kemner performance from Giro last year, where it's like, oh yes, great, you rolled over in ninth, which is great, which is good. But I would rather see Koi take, you know, two or three sprint stages at the uh, of Giro. Is that going to be possible with this? His lead out train is not exactly flush with big rulers. There's literally like Affini, Laporte, and Koi. Maybe you could throw Tratnik in there as well, but it's a little, it's it's just. A, a little bit light in all honesty especially when you consider there's so many of the great sprinters here it's definitely going to require a little bit of the savvy positioning which Laporte's very good at so I'd say overall a good Giro for them would be Koi gets two or three stage wins and I think Ita Brooks finishing top six I think that would be a good Giro yeah kind of a development Giro in some respect I mean getting European champion getting a stage as well maybe he to get up the road but um yeah you mentioned him Leonard Kemner that injury slipped by many people and he's kind of in a quite bad state he had a crash a training crash and yeah yeah I don't know the exact ins and outs of it but yeah he seemed in a in a, in a pretty bad way and I think he's just like out of action for the foreseeable future I can't remember what his program was exactly but struck by a driver and a seriously injured while training during an altitude camp in Tenerife mm. and in intensive care so that mm. yeah that was a bit alarming to hear that to be honest it is I think it just happened at the time when there was just so many bad injuries going around and emerging it was just sounds bad to say but it kind of just mixed into the fray a little bit there was just so much rubbish news going on in cycling at the time yeah at the moment his current program just says the Tour de France whether he'll make that or not I don't know but yeah it's a, it's a real shame because he's probably one of the best stage hunters like he's like Mr. Breakaway so I reckon he was probably thinking of you know a, a Tour de France stage hopefully he recovers in time and he can go there as well but it's just just the news of cycling is just bleak at the moment isn't it it's just crashes and injuries and When's this person going to come back and can they salvage season? It sounds bad to say salvage, considering that we don't really know the state of the riders, but Elijah, do we want to go on to another? But anyways, Patrick, we might as well come to the next story. Yeah, it's still a bleak one. Yeah. Same theme. Jonas Bingo, we spoke about him last week, and there's been a few updates about his condition. I mean, you and Ewan were saying to me that he, they're definitely going to send him even if he's just able to ride the bike uh, 10 kilometers, he'll do it. But uh, that seems to not be the case. They want him on full, full form. And uh, yeah, it seems like he's still in Spain in the hospital because he can't move because of the lung injury. This is just bad again, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We, we, we want the, tour, the reigning Tour de France champion at the Tour de France. That's what, that's what we really want. But they say that if he's not 100% fit, then he will not go to the tour which I think based upon yeah I mean based upon what I said last week I am a little bit surprised by that I did think that even if he was at 90% they'd still send him but obviously they just think if if he's not capable of winning then we're not sending him whatsoever 
which in a way is is honourable. You know, we're not just going to send the Tour de France champion just because that's what he is, and we're just going to parade him around, even if it's perhaps a slight detriment to his health to do that, and he's not absolutely ready. So that's you know, you got to take your hat off, and they're just kind of looking after the the rider first and foremost. Maybe we're going to end up doing what you said, which is that he's going to go to the Vuelta and probably just win that by five minutes or or something like that. But yeah, well, it is a shame that uh, the prospects of him going to the tour just seem to have taken a little bit of a, a dip this week. It does lean a little bit more towards like Pagacha. I mean, I remember like winning the tour. I do remember seeing. Uh, I can't remember. It was a clip or something. They were saying how you know should Pagacha just sack off the Giro because his chances of winning the tour, if he had just optimal preparation for it, would be quite high at the moment because unfortunately of the crash of his main rivals yeah in terms of uh, this melissa bike on tuesday they said that ringo had undergone a successful collarbone operation obviously that was one of the issues as well he will now spend the next few weeks recovering and it's not clear how long this will take we were wondering over how long uh, a collarbone and all the added things were going to take uh, his father made comments to the press complaining that he had not been able to visit his son and was struggling for information on his condition. Bingo is understood, however, to be accompanied by his wife, which I'm not sure if she is his wife. It, the media keeps saying this because I'm not sure if they're married because they weren't married when I met them. Um, and then it says it's unclear whether the 27-year-old is able to target the treble. The officials have indicated he will miss the altitude training camp in Sierra Nevada in May, a key building block towards the tour. And Richard Pluger has also said it's too early to talk about the tour. Tour of Denmark, go on, Jonas. Yeah. You, Machu, go for the tour of Denmark and send Wild there as well. Let's have a Galactico uh, fest at the tour of Denmark. Let's say, <laughs> hypothetically, Jonas doesn't go to the tour. Very similar to what we were just talking about beforehand. What would they realistically be able to get out of the tour without Jonas there. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, I like this. Yeah, who are they even sending? I don't know. Cruz? Yeah, at the moment it's Laporte, Coos, uh, Tratnik, Krausberg, Jorgensen, Benot, and it would be some other person replacing Jonas. I could see Sepp getting top five? Considering that he came, what was it? Was it eighth he came last year? But he had and a crash. Yeah. He had a crash in late on. Since then, he'd won, he'd, he won the Vuelta, so he obviously understands a little bit more about the, the onus of leadership. The TTKs, yeah, there's that kind of flatter one in the middle, but the one at the end is pretty hilly. But still, the TTs are massively suited to him. But, you know, if he is a smooth run-up into it, unlike Roglic and Remco, who are also still a little bit banged and bruised up, I don't know. I reckon Sep could definitely be a top five in the tour. And then a one, two, three UAE. One, two, three. Oh, gosh. Imagine uh, who they got. I mean, it's not out of a question. Would it be unrealistically, would it be unrealistic to think that Pagacha, Adam Yates, and Ayuso could be on the podium together with nobody else even contending? I'm not going to say that's going to happen because that would be really just a little bit rubbish to watch actually people were complaining about Van Der Poel winning a few too many races imagine UE having first second and third in the tour oh my word that would be so bad but go back to this Melissa bike Seb could be top five I think but what about Jorgensen do you reckon Jorgensen could do something I mean, I would prefer to see him as a stage hunter type, but I just think that there's no way that Ms. Melissa Bike are going to say, you won Paranese. You know, that was a good performance. Maybe they'd see what he can do in a three-week race. Maybe he could be a top 10 candidate as well, alongside Sepp. I'd allow people to go stage hunting. Send the note, send Tratnik, send Laporte, and just try and get people in the break, you know? I, I always feel like it's a bit of a shame when you have this massively... Like successful team, they've got so many fantastic riders in there, but they're almost just like their, their, their talent is squashed, and you, you don't really get to see it too much in a grand tour setting. Like I would love to see Benoit be unleashed 
as a, as a breakaway candidate a bit more. I think he would be really versatile and Tratnik similarly. Um, back when he was on like Bahrain victorious or whatever, he used to get in the breaks all the time. So I don't think that Jonas missing the tour, it, it is a big blow, but I don't think it's the end of the world for this Melissa bike. I still think they can get a decent amount out of a race. And they're not going to get the yellow jersey, so for me, that is end of the world. Yeah. Probably. That would be a bit of an issue, I will admit. <laughs> oh, so Coos first winner since uh Lance, no, uh Floyd, oh, no. Oh gosh. Uh Greg Lamont. Uh, uh uh which one are we going for? Uh okay. <laughs> the yeah, bide field of trying to suss out the, the history of the previous American winner of oh, my word. But we might as well switch our focus a bit. Uh, go back to the Giro d'Italia because yes, well we're not won't be going there, but uh Friend of someone, um, I'm a big fan, and uh, sometimes the comments get a bit annoyed at me for being a fan of him. 23 years old, already a national symbol, father, husband, a star in his own country. This is, of course, Binyam Gamay. He is returning to the the Giro d'Italia for the first time since 2022. And, I mean, Patrick, he's had a bit of like an up and down in since that Giro d'Italia Blamo moment, obviously beating Macho Van der Poel on stage 10, then taking the points classification jersey as well because of that win or holding the jersey. Then his whole Giro just kind of literally, yeah, because of a champagne bottle, we all know that. And uh, since then, he's, he's still had some good results here and there. He won a stage in the Tour de Suisse. He won the, uh, what was it called, the Torquay classic surf classic earlier this year he's he's been up here and there about showing flashes of of that form that we're all expecting he was talking early on in the season that uh last year was a real big test for him as well he felt all the pressure just mounting on him because he won game well game and at your detail stage in the same year then at the tour de france came close a few times i mean maybe for macho van der Poel and jasper philipson doing a few naughties then he could have had a better result, but who knows if spots, maybe, as you say. Could have, should have, would have, is what you say. And, uh, yeah, what do you think uh, Giro 2024 could look like for Bini? There are a number of sprinters. You've already mentioned all of Koi, so it's certainly not exactly a done deal that he's going to be all-conquering. Well, he wasn't all-conquering, but he was all up there really learning how to do the Grand Tour racing and uh, several top fives in the sprints, and then that great stage that was more suited to him than a sprinter. There are actually quite a few stages which suit Binny in the Giro. It's also worth noting that he is still down to start the tour as well. So he is doing a a, a double. He's doing two Grand Tours. Um, he's doing Pagacha, but as a sprinter, basically, is what I'm trying to say. But even in like the first week, stage three, with, with like three Ks from the finish line, there's a 1.8 climb at 4.2%. The day after that, 1.8 kilometer climb, 4.4 percent, and that comes with you know even less distance to the finish line. Like stage nine's really suited towards Binny. There's lots of these tricky stages. Stage 12 really looks like that Napoli stage, which Thomas de Ghent won, uh, where Binny and Van der Poel were off the front. I reckon that's another good one for him. I'd say the further on you get into the race, the less the race suits Binny. But I do think that the first two weeks are really good for him. So, again, Eddie Merck's distaste incoming. But it wouldn't surprise me if he did the first two weeks and bailed if the Chiclamina wasn't going too well. Obviously, he was set quite well to win the Chiclamina back in 2022. So maybe that's the goal. Is that, okay, Philipson at the tour is going to be a hard nut to crack. But maybe we can do it at the Giro because I think that I'm a bit more versatile than the other sprinters. I'd say that's a pretty realistic ambition is that Binny could try and go for a Chiclamino and put the demons of 2022 behind him. I think that would certainly be a cool thing for Intermarche to really rally around this year. I think he's going to be petrified if he wins a stage to touch a uh, Prosecco bottle, that's for sure. You're wearing goggles. Yeah, exactly. Just like, don't touch it, Biddy. You don't need it. It's, it's not that important. Their victory is more important. But I mean, 
Yeah, uh, in terms of rivals, who are you seeing as kind of big threats? I mean, Koi, obviously a big threat. I don't know if Maspilosin is going to the race. He's like someone I, I would be quite fearful from. Okay, he's not down on the list, but uh, Jonathan Milan is. You've got the likes of, not Naito Quintana, <laughs> but uh, in terms of Caleb Ewan, I mean, he, he's been in the mix with him. Uh, in the past beating him but uh, Lawrence Pithy is even there on the start list so I mean it's there isn't a Jasper Philipson to be scared of so Hayden Groves oh true I mean he hasn't had the best year it's worth noting but he's certainly won I'm looking like the versatile sprinter so somebody like Wellsford I'm not expecting to be able to compete over the hillier terrain but like you say Pithy has had a really good year and he could certainly launch a bit of a surprise. Coy is surprisingly good at climbing as well. Jonathan Milan was surprising us all during Ferena, so it wouldn't surprise me if he managed to do something similar. Jakobsen is here, Malia is here. So he's obviously faster sprinters on the absolute pan flat stuff, but when it gets a little bit bumpy, I do think that Binny will have the advantage. And if he can get into some breakaways as well, yeah, I think realistically he could win a couple of stages especially the ones which are a little bit tougher if his team sets a really tough pace. And I think with a Chiclamino is within reach as well. I mean, one of the things we were talking about in the tour was that the positioning of Bini wasn't great and uh, there's still a young lead-out t- train as well. So that's a factor. Um, yeah, hopefully another year they learn better. They, they have gotten big trees together as well. So it's not like it's not happening so yeah which stage would you say is a banker for them or like a key stage for them early on you said stage nine looked pretty good is the other one stage nine especially just because it's got a couple of climbs beforehand it means that you're going to be able to soften up those sprinters so i think that coin might survive a stage four with just like one you know big effort to get over that kind of four percent climb Whereas I think that the repeatedness of stage nine almost looks a little bit San Remo-esque, but kind of more climbs towards the end. It's like having four Poggios in the space of 30Ks. And I think that's more Binny's kind of thing. So I'd say especially stage nine. I mean, I almost think this is a response to how the classics was going for him. Finished seventh and didn't well again. Obviously, they wanted more. Um, and then they've kind of just reevaluated everything and think, okay, what are we going to get out of this? A Giro that would actually be quite good for your learning, for everything, for your development, and then we might actually get some results out of that. Yeah, I reckon so. you got to just sometimes, it's like the, the old, what was it, sunk cost fallacy. It's like basically stopping doing something even though you've committed quite heavily to it because you realized that by continuing, you could essentially dig yourself into a deeper hole. That's essentially what it is. So, yeah, drawing a line underneath the classics and saying, you know what, these just aren't going how we're expecting them to go, and reevaluating, like you say, and going, well, okay, let's do the Giro instead. You can pause this now, we'll focus on the Giro. and then we'll focus on the tour after that. But yeah, I mean, we might as well close the chapter on. And uh, into Marche and that, but the Edge Plus to the Edge is coming. Fourth monument of the year. I mean, Tad Gatches on the start list. All his rivals seem to have crashed out, unfortunately. And um, yeah, Patrick, his return to, well, no, he was there last year. He just crashed in a, a pothole placed by Patrick Lefebvre, as you allegedly claim happened. But uh, is it, yeah. yeah, why am I saying allegedly? He's not going to sue us for that. Uh, it's a joke, uh, Lefebvre. Uh, we do like you, uh, just not sometimes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Patrick, uh, is there anyone who can even challenge Tata Bogaccio? Or are you just going to see like what we saw with Amstel Gold last year, where he kind of just rides into the sunset, or like Strad Bianchi as well this year? Because I don't want to sign up to that. No. Uh, maybe there's hope in the fact that Vanderpool didn't win Amstel, so therefore Bogaccio's victory, you know, you, you, can't, you can't just bank on the fact that because they're the big favourite that they're going to win so they're certainly worthwhile you know it's worthwhile still looking at the other options let's I mean 
we'll talk about Van der Poel. I mean, you, you're perhaps more optimistic about his chances than I am. But I, I, I'm not entirely certain. But I'm looking at guys like like Skelmos. I think that he didn't get everything out of Amstor, I don't think. I think he needs a harder race, to be honest. And yeah, I think that Liège provides that. I think Van Hills is an interesting one to be looking at as well. Podium finisher of Strada Bianchi. He's obviously one to be looking out for. Pidcock, winner of Hamstel, taking me three time, three names to get to him. He's certainly not to be sniffed at. Ben Healy, because Nafwa, I mean, arguably the biggest threat of them all, Scott, comes from Alexei Lutsenko, obviously, because he, he won the Giro de Bruzzo, and he, you know, he's obviously in great form. And you, you may smirk, but he finished. I was going to say that he finished really well in this race last year. He DNF'd. That does not support my point at <laughs> all. Uh, he finished fifth in Amstel last year and then did nothing. But my point being, there could be a couple of outsiders who do something in this race. All it takes is a small group of semi-favorites to get off the front like it did in Amstel. Everybody looks to UEE, who are probably going to be chasing all day. They run out of men, and then it's all everybody looking at Pagatcha. Like it's not, it's not a done deal. I'm trying to provide a little bit of optimism for the counterpoint that Pagatcha is not just going to ride away on Lara Dut, leave everyone for dust, and and then he just gets another monument victory. Yeah, I mean. We like Tata Rajat, but I mean, we don't like one-sided races. That's it's the same reason why nobody wants to watch Formula 1 when Max Verstappen just goes off the front. Oh my goodness, the amount of times we've hinted at uh, Formula 1 in this podcast is almost criminal. We're not a podcast uh, for Formula 1. But uh, in terms of, well, if we if we stay on that Alexei Lutsenko, Mr. Kazakhstan uh, for the time being, Kazakhstan has some history with this race. Maxim Glinski, I remember him winning this race, uh, dropping Nibali, and then Alexander Vinokurov in 2010. A bit of a, let's say, controversial way that that race was won. Alleged bribes, all these things with him and Kolob, Kol- Kol- Kovalev, the Russian rider who rode for, I'm not sure who he was riding for at the time, but he definitely rode for uh, Saxon Bank at some point. So, I mean, it's a great race. It's interesting, but yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay, the course was a bit, uh, the finish was different as well. But yeah, it is a bit glooming with the prospect that we could have had Remco versus Roglic versus Tadogacha, and now it's just Tadogacha. There's not even, yeah, okay, t- Pickcock winning, that was absolutely great. But my case for Machuanapol is he was just using Amstel as a tune up. He doesn't care about Amstel. He's won Amstel. He doesn't do these win the race twice. I, yeah, of course, uh, Flanders and Roubaix are a bit different. But that was for a reason. Amstel doesn't matter. It's not a monument. Um, but Liège, Pastor Liège, he could be the rider with the most monuments in the peloton right now. He could outdo Tad Bagaccia. Wait, Tad Bagaccia hasn't got Roubaix. He hasn't got Milan Tanro. But yeah, so there we have it. And then he just wins Lombardia. Uh, later this year. I think that that is the master plan that's happening for the world champion. How? How, How does Van der Poel win? He is bust on the edge. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I wasn't planning on questions, but... Uh... Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. let, 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 let's, let's think about it. The problem is, he's Matthew Van der Poel and he's got some massive bands on his back, so he's not exactly inconspicuous. <laughs> He can't. It's gonna be. He can't just ping it off the front Pidcock style and just like hope to hold off Poggy. He's got to actually face him like mano a mano up a laugh for a dude, which isn't the Poggio. It's it's steeper and it's gonna be hard. I'm I'm not saying the chance is zero. I'm just saying that it's not like. I don't think he's like a massive favourite. I just think it's too hilly for him. I mean, I, there is a reality where I could where I'm, I'm wrong here, and he actually follows Pagacha, and he beats him in a sprint. 
mano a mano, and the world absolutely loses it. And then <laughs> Il, Lombi- Il Lombardia route is changed to just a tiny puncher, like Flemish classic <laughs> in the end of the year because they want Mandible to go back to get all five. It's not. It's not impossible. Uh but I just, I just don't see a world where he manages to hang on to Poggy when he attacks. Poggy one-upped him and embarrassed him in the Tour of Flanders last year, so now he wants to come to Ugacha's territory and one-up him. I think what he needs is a Patrick Lefebvre pothole <laughs> at some point in the route. I mean, if you took Pogaccia away... Yeah, Manipal is still not like the firm favorite. No, I mean, if you took Pogaccia away, who would be the favorite? I think it's just really close among so many riders. I mean, even UAE, they still got Hershey, who was very good today. You still got Pidcock. I mean, it's a lot of the Amstel gold names, in all honesty, who are going to be competing in it. But I think there was a lot of names in Amstel who were in the group behind in that peloton who didn't really get to show themselves fully. And I think that's mainly Kuznefwa. And I think it's Skelmos, Jensen. And maybe even like Dylan Turns and Stephen Williams from Israel Premier Tech as well. So I think there was quite a lot of... like We don't know the full form of some people based upon Amstel Gold. I think that's a, it's a hard race to draw conclusions from. There was some, it, it was a bit of a weird top 10 in all honesty. But yeah, if you take out Pogaccia... I would put my money on Skelmas, I reckon. I mean, we're going to be doing a preview about this on the cycling day in extra, uh, so we won't spoil too much. But uh, yes, yeah, so check that out uh, as well. Shameless plug as well. That's because Ewan's not here, so now we can just plug away. Patrick has his Audio Cycling uh, Metal Games coming out on the Flesh for Loan, uh, of Flesh for Loan, so check that out. But in terms of, we might as well come to the final part of the show. Ride of the Week. Ride of the Week is Alexi Lutsenko. Oh, it was absolutely them. criminal to not to use him for winning and absolutely putting UAE team members in a box in the Il Giro d'Abruzzo, which is, as we all know, the fourth Grand Tour of the year. It's one of the most prestigious races going. Um, you just haven't heard about it because you, you weren't paying attention. He, on the Plati de Tivo, literally just ruined UE team members. They tried to one to him and Lutsenko showed them all who's boss. Ten out of ten performance. Lutsenko is 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 here. This is it. This is just the start of many great things. So I, mean, Scott, I almost <laughs> I almost want to give it to Joe Blackmore. You could do, but Turns didn't win. It's like he brought it back for Turns to finish second. That's the only thing. Oh, he yeah. did the 23 Liège, actually. And right. do we quite call it? Yeah, this week as well, he won the Circuit de Ardennes as well. So he won a stage race, the under 23, finished top five in a world tour race. And I think that uh, warrants him getting uh, another okay. another ride of the week. Uh, obviously, he's won races here, there, and everywhere this year. Tour of Rwanda, Tour tour of Taiwan I mean yeah he's just collecting all these stage races around the world so one more thing before we sign off um, do you think Blackmore is going to stay at Israel for Emir Tech oh you're, you're thinking in your screen is going to sign him well, I, I, I'm just wondering is, just, just, a, just a yes or no do you reckon he stays there or do you reckon he goes somewhere else mm, I mean they have the funds they they're not paying for him six million so and if they're going up to World Tour as well with all these good results on the back of him and all his other teammates, they also won the Tour Down Under. So, I mean, is he the place to leave right now? It looks pretty good. That's true. It is. Would well, you man, rather get lost? Would you rather get lost in a big team? Well, if I was to think, it's her. Ms. Melissa, I could probably also look at him thinking, hmm, yes, I think we will just take a little bit of that. We need some more Brits to add to our academy. Yeah, we need, yeah, yeah. We've already got loads. We don't need any more. Yeah, he's good. He's going to have a real good future. Looking forward to it. A big shout out to a Danish talent as well. Uh, the former team of Jonas Bingo. Oh, we didn't even mention David Godu. He was flying, winning the Tour du Jura as well. Oh, um, 
Yeah, true. He did win. He's sandbagging. <laughs> Car does rock up as like one of the best climbers to a Paul Jura race and put what is his name, Jujat or whatever his name, into a box. But you know, David Godu wins it anyway, so it's all right. I mean, it's good. It's a good thing for Group Palmer at least, with their bad news of everybody leaving. And uh, uh, Lenny Lenny Martinez went on the Tour du Doup as well. And also, there was another French stage race, a two point two. We don't normally talk by two by two races, but there was a Danish winner, Emil uh, uh, Toldal, winning. So, uh, yeah, you've mentioned that. Would you have mentioned that result if the winner wasn't Danish? <laughs> no. Ah, <laughs> uh, the bias. Oh, but anyways, that's basically it for us. And uh, thank you for joining us on episode 64, if my count is correct, of the National Cycling Podcast. Hopefully we'll have Ewan back next week or maybe a visit from Jack Burke. But uh, yeah, uh, make sure you can find more about Patrick on Audu Cycling and also on the Cycling Day and Extra and the Cycling Day, all these things. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the channel here. Hit the like button. Comment down below what you thought of anything we discussed. We always love your comments. And of course, as always, thank you for watching and we will see you next week.